Good afternoon and welcome to the last guest speaker of the year. Because the next four weeks we'll have pieces presentations. But this afternoon, we're gonna go out with a bang. Wayne Kestenbaum. Kestenbaum. Kustenbaum, thank you. Wayne Kustenbaum, poet, critic, writer of fiction and nonfiction, artist, filmmaker, and performer, is the author of more than 20 books, including Stubble Archipelago, a collection of poems published by Semiotext in March of 2020 or just last month. Um, and going back a couple decades, uh, The Queen's Throat, Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire, which was published in 1993, before some of y'all were born. The Queen's Throat was described um, as, quote, an inquest into the singularity of gay opera fandom. I like the idea that it's an inquest, uh, which was, um, that book was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Wayne's paintings, also a painter, have been included in solo shows at White Columns, 356 Mission, University of Kentucky Art Museum, and many group shows, including some pretty hip galleries, Essex, Essex Flowers, Gordon Robichaux, Klaus von Nixtagend, Yossi Milo, Fireman, all in New York, Jeff Bailey Gallery, Jeffrey Young Gallery, and FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. Wayne has performed his Sprechstimme uh, vocal improvisations at the Kitchen here in New York, Red Cat in Los Angeles, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Renaissance Society, known as the Ren in Chicago, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, and bringing it home, the Poetry Project in New York City. He's also released an album with Ugly Duckling Records and made a feature film that premiered at Union Docs Center for Documentary Art in our very own Ridgewood, Queens. Wayne has received numerous honors and awards, including a Discovery the Nation Poetry Prize. It's the Poetry Prize of the Nation magazine, um, one of the nation's oldest magazines. Um, a Whiting, very prestigious Whiting Award, which if you guys were professional writers, you would know about. And um, a Guggenheim Fellowship. Wayne did his undergraduate work at Harvard University, got a master's at Johns Hopkins, and completed his doctoral work at Princeton University, a PhD. He has taught at Yale, I think among other places, and is currently distinguished professor of English, French, and comparative literature at the City University of New York Graduate Center, CUNY Grad Center. Please join me in giving a warm and respectful welcome to Wayne Hess Christenbaum. Really happy to be back at SBA. When I was starting out as a visual artist, which was rather late in life, in my 50s, I took figure drawing classes in this building religiously. They were, it was a, a remarkable experience with Anton von Dahlen. I don't know if he still teaches here. But he's really great, a really great artist. So I'm going to move between modes here to give you some sense of who I am. Um, first, a little bit of slideshow, and then I'm going to show you some movies. So the thing I'm working on right now and that is taking all my time and passion is I'm doing some of my Schrechstimme vocal piano improvisations here in New York City. Schrechstimme is a German word meaning speak, sing. I'm not really a singer. So my form of kind of intellectual cabaret is to half sing. And I'm doing, I have a residency right now at a club called the Francis Kite Club on Avenue C at 4th Street 
with the residency I call the group Tickling Experiment, which is also going to be the title of my next book of poems. And there are three installers. The first was The Blood Drinkers, and I premiered a film called uh, The Blood Drinkers, a 17-minute film, my first horror film. The second show was called Stigma Pudding, and I premiered a film called Un Coup de Day, A Throw of the Dice, starring Michael Walensky, who is standing right there at the urinal. And then the third program, which is this Friday, and I urge you to attend this food. Reserve in advance, it's $5. It's $10 at the door. This one is called Shaving Lessons. And the guy, I've, had a super, I've made a Super 8 and digital video film of a, a guy named Adam Eli. Um, and this is him shaving. I'm gonna premiere that movie as well as a little stop motion animation film called Blowers this Friday night, and I'm going to play Bruno, Barry, Simonovsky, Antile, Chopin, Hugh Martin, The Beatles, and, and a couple of others. And so all I have done for the last six months is play the piano, which is oddly regressive, because I the days of piano practice were in my youth before I became a writer and then a visual artist. And so I think of certainly classical piano as a realm of absolute dutifulness. No whimsy, no libido, no, no play. But for me, I would say the triumph of my life in my personal way, not, as, not to the outside world, but to myself, my happiness is that I have, in some sense, taken back the art forms of my childhood. As a, as a middle-aged elder person, I have gone back and ransacked the kingdom of childhood and found the arts imperfectly practiced as a youth and found ways to bring them out in, in a seasoned adult libidinal way. And one way I think this is through piano performance. On the right there, I am at the Hammer Museum two uh, springs ago. I had a residency in a group show called Life's. And every day for one week, at 50 minutes past the hour, every hour of the day that the museum, from 11 till seven when the museum was open, I would walk to this little corner of the exhibit and I would improvise at the piano for exactly 10 minutes. And so it was a kind of uh, monastic regime because I was there all the time at the museum and I had 50 minutes in between each set to prepare for the next one, which was largely improvised, but I would have scraps of music in the green room that I would put together. Uh, and here I am on the left playing in the kitchen in 2015. That was the first time I had done this weird thing of playing the piano while improvising in, into the mic. On the right here is the cover of my new book, Stubble Archipelago. At the end of the reading, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna read you a poem from it. Other recent books of mine on the left here is my Trance Trilogy, three books published from 2015 to 2022, The Pink Trance Notebooks, Camp Marmalade, and Ultramarine, that were in autobiographical investigations and something like automatic writing. I wrote constantly without forethought. And after, like in these notebooks, and after a year, at the end of the year, I would harvest from those notebooks certain tidbits and gleanings and assemble them in these kind of tapestries or assemblages. And on the right is a, a book of short fiction called The Cheerful Scapegoat, which I published with Semiotex in 2021. On the left here is my most recent book of essays, Figure It Out. And on the right, here I am in my studio taking a self-portrait. And so now we're gonna land in the realm of art. I'm gonna show, I've been making movies, first of all, just on my phone, and now with 16 millimeters, Super 8, and digital video. Absolutely do-it-yourself videos in the tradition of artists, cinema, zero budget. Cinema, and also in the tradition of the essay film where writers, people who are primarily oriented toward the word in a way, use film as a way to construct uh, 
tableaus, manifestos, diaries, notebooks. It's a remarkable tradition, this tradition of the essay film. And it's the, uh, the notion I'm sure you are completely all familiar with that of taking this form of media movies that is so seeming to come to us from above, from commerce, capitalism, what have you, from ideology, and just using it for ourselves and for all that I may inveigh with everybody else against social media for its evisceration of the arts of attention, which include the arts of reading and writing, for me, has been a path, uh, social media has been a pathway back to the analog cinematic media of my childhood, Super 8. And so when I say I harvested the, the art practices of my youth before I knew they were art practices, when I was a kid, I had a Super 8 camera, and it was my prime passion. And now I have a newer Super 8 camera, but it's still out of date. It's still an impossible lost technology. I, I like lost technologies. I think that's also why I became a painter. I'm going to show you a, a, a trailer, just like 30 seconds of a movie I made quite recently. It's called Stigma Pudding. And it's a comp compilation of an improvisatory performance video I made um, in my alter ego persona of whose name is October Castel Nuovo Spielhaus. It's basically me. It's not, you know, I'm not like putting on a wig exactly or anything. It's it's not gonna go too out on the limb, but it goes a little out of the limb for me. And I've juxtaposed this or superimposed it with hand-painted 16 millimeter footage, which is something I've been into for the last year, which is uh, bleaching found 16 millimeter film stock or buying blank 16 millimeter leader, bless you, and painting on it, scratching it, um, and then getting it, splicing it all together, then getting it digitized, and then adding a digital soundtrack. And so this film, Stigma Pudding, which you'll see just a second of. I'm here to crack down on orgasms like rhododendron cluttering the garden. That's what orgasms have become in this fallen world. Okay, that's that was even only a 20 seconds. So I'm gonna show you a I'm gonna show you a longer 16 uh, millimeter film called I Started Selling Sadness, in which I do not appear. It's simply spliced together damaged, altered 16 millimeter film with a poem soundtrack of my voice, my poem, written in response to the footage. I started selling sadness, commingled with my ex. He had COVID and the Santa Cruz super cute peccadillo. Anyway, the embargo, time, and time again, already outside of New York City, the ocean of the other, my father's skateboarding, discontented retail details, neither eggs nor other undelivered cakes. I washed my feet in my father's crazy and famous rum cake. The house, the house, the El Decor, nothingness and its gas, your insinuating marinara over mom's insinuating coalescence, and the stuck circus and the Alex and his other Alex reissuing the phantasms of decolonized bath houses and the etiquette manuals thereof. Saw sauce, say sauce, saw sauce. Saw it twice. 
like empty afternoon and the husband's hexiety pushing the hummingbird toward a humid brassiness. We are afraid of the jock strap and its sauce and the inexpressive dictator's estuary. That I owe, that I owe to Negative Land, which is the film processing place in Ridgewood, which is a NECA. And I owe it to them because they took this reel that I composed of the spliced together film that was painted on, it, a reel that in a way was unprojectable. I couldn't even project it in my own 16 millimeter camera. It would just, the projector would destroy it. It was too thick. Um, but they, uh, they hand, you know, you can bring them this stuff as long as it's not wet. And they digitize it and color correct it. And then you have it. And it's a phenomenal bridge between the analog and the digital. Such a such a pleasure. I'm going to go back to this slideshow for a sec and show you very quickly uh, some two dimensional stuff. So I I begun taking photographs, but I with a, a Nikon like analog photographs. But I don't know what I'm saying. But but I'm, that it's the zone of maximum timorousness. For me, maximum trepidation for some reason, analog photography, but it's the zone that tingles the most for me with possibility. So here are two analog portraits and then a color analog portrait on the left. On the right is a silk screen. I had a residency at a place in Kingston called Eureka. And um, I was asked to produce a bunch of silk screens connected to the silent film actress Hida Berra, because the playwright Jillian Merlo was putting together a show called On Stage with Hida Berra. And it's a long story, but my task was to do whatever I wanted as long as it included Hida Berra. So I made a, a whole installation of silk screens, including stills from my photos, drawings, Etc. Like you can see in the on the right, you can see right in the middle a still from the film you just saw, and then at the bottom is Fida Bear, and at the top here is a still from one of my one of my movies called Armini du Soir. Here on the left is the entire installation. Uh, it's not a very good picture, but you get the sense of multiplicity. On the, on the right is a, a cyanotype. I've begun experimenting with the most basic form of cyanotype and incorporating them in two-dimensional paintings. On the left is what produces the cyanotype, which is objects laid on this treated paper. On the right is a finished cyanotype mounted and turned into a painting. Here's two more of these cyanotype works. Here on the left, you can see scraps of cyanotype uh, base of, of um, contact sheets, the, the strips that form kind of legs. On the right is, now I'm going to show you some more or less recent paintings. They're really quite small scale. Oil, acrylic, ink, pen, the one on the right is called Episodes in a Life of Levity. It's a dense collage, in a sense, a, 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 a narrative. I then think of all the paintings I've done in the last decade as film stills, waiting. You know, they're all waiting for the animation to happen. Here's two more. The left is the one on the left is called What the Algorithm Knew, and it contains a self portrait photo that you may recognize from the beginning of the slideshow. Now these are works on paper, very small, nine by twelve. I, I, I suppose writerly in their dependence on the drawn and signifying line.
I do love scratching you know, I like scratching. It's why I like scratching 16 millimeter film. So on the left, the being able to, to draw by taking a, like a sharp H or F pencil and using it as a kind of uh, into the wet paint. On the right is a, a a painting collage that uses bits of uh, footage from my 16 millimeter experiments. I don't know if it's too small for you to see, but there's little bits, little bits of scraps. In my studio, I have so many interesting little scraps of 16 millimeter film and dismembered slides. On the left is a piece that is entirely composed of slides from the 50s, 60s, whatever, that I've dismembered to use in my, um, as like little bits of applique in my films. On the right is what is my editing table, but it's also a kind of installation. This is what the, before I splice the bits of film together, this is what they look like on the right. And here too are two close-ups of of what that film looks like when it's not been uh, digitized or projected on the left. This is just bleach footage. And you can see, here's the areas that I put tape on, so there's resist. So when I put it in the bleach, this, bits of, this bit of footage remains, but this remains territory to be written over as it were. And here this is thoroughly painted over. The tragedy is that yellow isn't going to turn out as yellow when I when it's projected. Like this is an error because it's an it, I did this with like an opaque marker and it, it looks just brown. Like I think in the in the I started selling sadness film, there's a lot of like kind of brown on top of it. It was pink and yellow and it just ended up brown. Okay, these are paintings. Uh, I consider them, I call them cloud poems because of these like lines of the face text. But I also now think of them as film scripts. And here are three of the largest paintings I've done. They're like four feet by four feet. And they are, again, kind of like anthologies of marks notebooks in a way for sequential inscriptions. I'm gonna now show you another film. Having introduced you to my two-dimensional visual vocabulary of scratches, marks, ideograms, cartoonish characters. Here is a stop motion animation I made quite recently called Scenes from a Marriage.
Now, despite the abstract, the childish abstraction of all that, people are my main interests. And most of the films I've made and many of the paintings I've done are, 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 are portraiture. And so I'm going to show you now a, uh, an example of a, a kind of film that I've mostly done, which is a portrait of a friend. And it's very sad to show you this one because Peter Zeminski is the friend that I'm going to show you this portrait of. He died in December. So I think he was an amazing artist. So I feel kind of, I'm happy to be able to show this to you because I'm really happy I made this film with him two years ago. He was younger than I was, no idea that he would be dead now. But I, I feel that, the, that there's a historical dimension to a commitment to portraiture, which is that none of us are going to be around forever. And even self-portraiture, even the selves that we capture year to year, you know, we are also in a state of metamorphosis. And what we're recording is uh, really, it, it's a tactile sense of history as it is happening. happening. So it, to that extent, it, as a writer, I'm a documentarian in a way and an autobiographical writer as a poet as well. And in some sense, I am an autobiographical visual artist as well, even in these abstractions like this. This is a kind of documentation of the three months in my life that I spent gradually accreting these marks into a painting. And so that even though it is simultaneous there, a more accurate version of that painting would be the film of its making. And so here's a little portrait of my friend Peter. It's fun. That's more distorted, but it sounds kind of good. It's a distraction versus like the songs that we were listening to before. Uh, let me show you uh, one other poetry film. This is a, I, the one I wanted to show you, suddenly isn't there. I'm going to show you instead, it's still a portrait. This is a three minute clip from the film I mentioned that I premiered at the Kite Club uh, a month ago. It's called En Coup de Day. It's a film version of uh, Stefan Mallarmé's famous poem from like over 100 years ago that revolutionized poetry by scattering the words of the poem all over the page. It's in a way, at least in, in European poetry, it was the first utterly visual poem. And in some ways, its innovations are still resonating and have not yet been fully um, realized. So it was, and I, the, the, the portrait is of my friend Michael Walensky, who has a tattoo, and Coup de Day, the name of that poem. And so it's a languorous, libidinal portrait of, of Michael. And it's, it, I, it's shot with a new camera that I have that shoots in 4K. So part of me is just naively in love with the, the texture of the film. And the soundtrack is also my piano improv.
wrote a long time ago, in 2001, a biography, a short biography of Andy Warhol, whose films changed my life utterly. When I uh, agreed, you know, took on the project of writing a short biography of Andy Warhol, I didn't even know he was a filmmaker. And in time, the, my sense of the, the rapture of this filmmaking process overtook my admiration for his paintings. His films are, um, this film that I just showed you an excerpt of is obviously very influenced by Warhol's style, which involves uh, erasing the difference between stillness and motion and finding the, in a way, the erotic threshold or hinge where stillness and animation meet. So, I'm going to now go back to the slideshow and get to some more figurative work. So, I, on the way to the figurative work, I'll say I've enjoyed painting unfound cardboard. These pieces um, and, and others like it, I call cardboard couture. One on the left is cardboard couture. I also do a lot of paintings on, in a way like notebook pages, on 18 by 24 paper oil paintings. And they're quite notational and I think also writerly in their emphasis on lines. I wrote an essay in my 2013 book called My 1980s and Other Essays. I wrote an essay called Odd Secrets of the Line. Actually, it's in a different book. It's in Figure It Out from 2020. Odd Secrets of the Line. It's a line by Emily Dickinson. She said that as one who returns, that a, and I as somebody returned as if from a long voyage, have odd secrets of the line to tell. That line has always spoken to me as a poet and as a visual artist, odd secrets of the line. Here are uh, just eight, like nine by 12 drawings, also in the mode of assemblages. And I would love to see the fish on the right going up to the butt. I would love to hear that. Really, all these, they need to be moved around, the little pieces. Okay, now on the right starts my pandemic of figure drawing. I spent really much of the pandemic doing figure drawing, most of it on Zoom with friends and in classes, but also having people to my studio when COVID would clear enough to allow for human contact. And again, my training as a figure artist is simply through assiduous practice and through the kind tutelage of Anton Mundal in this building, but I'm in no means uh, a maestro, a figure drawing, but nonetheless, it captivates me as a sort of, the word I guess in geometry is asymptote, a line that never reaches the ceiling, two lines where one of them never reaches parallelism with the other, but just crawls toward it. I am toward the figure asymptotic. I crawl toward it. So this is, these are also just portraits of people. I can tell you the names and stories of each one. So I have like really about 300 of these, and I would like to have them be a book, I think. See, he's wearing a mask. So is he on the left? Kev is wearing a mask. Poor guy, the right doesn't even have a face. But sometimes it's better that way. See, on the left here on the top is my favorite thing as a visual artist to do, I think, which is in a way mad inscription. Fastidious and detailed and somewhat symbolic, but not in a recognized code. Uh, art historians have often used the word asemic to describe this practice, A-S-E-M-I-C. Asemic writing is writing 
without signs, without recognized alphabets. And I don't know if you feel this as well, but if you have a, a wish to write, but you don't want to write words, but you want the, the feeling of writing. And then here, just like regular paintings of figures, lonely but confident figures that I think of as dolmens, D O L M E N. A dolmen is like Stonehenge is a dolmen. It's a, it's kind of, I think of it, it's a clump of rock, say, that has some memorial significance. And the, the figures that I paint are often dolmen like in their isolated occupation of a certain plot of ground. Right, these guys on the left, uh, don't they look like dolmens? I mean, first they look like animation figures just yearning to hop. But they also look like the kind of dumb, half asleep presences that animals or teddy bears may recognize, would represent to us what psych psychologists have called transitional objects. A lot of my paintings, I think, are about transitional objects, queer, rueful personages propped in landscapes. And as I'm assembling a painting, I think of it as a quest for seeking the comfort and equipoise of that figure that I just pointed out. Here's some more large kind of anthology-esque paintings. These I call novels. We did about eight of these, each named after a novel by a woman writer that I loved. Uh, like one is called Everything is Nice. I think the one on the left is called Everything is Nice, based on a Jane Bowles short story. The one on the right is called A Novel of Thank You, which is a novel by Gertrude Stein. And these are also diary paintings assembled over many months. The marks gradually accreting and forming something between a quilt and a narrative. Here's now really much earlier paintings that have a different form of narrative equipoise. The one on the right is called Minotaur. Okay, now really early. I started painting in 2010. The one on the left is from 2013. The one on the right is 2012. This was the earliest form of portraiture that I did. This kind of thing where I would have a figure drawing that I would then mono print onto a prepared oil painted surface, maybe that had abstractions, but this stuff was already there. And then I took the picture of David and I mono printed it on there, just the lines. And then a face, the background to just leave the tattoos. And the, on the right is it what I think of as a series of German landscapes because they remind me of German expressionist colors. On the left is true. It's from my second year of painting. On the right is a self-portrait in the style I used to paint in. It's almost life-size. On the left is another portrait done in that monotype way where I have a figure drawing, in this case, just a portrait that I, I, I do oil lines around. I, it's actually quite a elaborate process. I trace the pencil drawing first on tracing paper. I turn the tracing paper upside down. I put, with a fine brush, oil all along the graphite, the, the back side of the graphite lines. And then I print that on top of a prepared surface, leaving the traces of that drawing. As somebody doing a studio visit years ago said, why don't you just do the drawing in the canvas? And I said, I really dare. <laughs> and the right is a very early painting. There's a little bit of collage. A friend, Angelo Nicolopoulos, used this as the cover of his book called Obscenely Yours. I think he identified with a red figure lying prone. 
The thing, painting on the left was the cover for my book of poems in 2012 called Blue Stranger with Mosaic Background. And that's that painting. Here are two of my very earliest paintings from 2010. And these were, I think the one on the left was the one is, is what began with the tracing from like a foreign magazine and then going to town on it. And on the right is a, a selfie of my friend Angelo Nicolopoulos, whose poetry book used my painting. You know, I said, Angelo gave me a, gave me a selfie and I'll make you a painting. He gave me the selfie and I gave him, I made a painting of him. And I realized right away that he loves problems. I love him. But we all love problems. And this is the last slide I'm going to show you. It seems, well, yeah, I do pose problems. And also, I'm interested in posing. I like, and I maybe the relation between the artist and the one posing is a problem. I don't know. This is my, this is my insignia. This is my calling card. I pose problems. Let me see. We have uh, we have just a little bit of time, and I'm going to show you one more movie. And then I'll take questions after the break. What? Oh, oh the poem. Yeah. Okay. 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 Michelle Movie and then the poem. Okay. First, I thought you were saying you can't stop yet. There's that too. Okay. Okay. Here's here's the film I couldn't find. This is a portrait of my friend E.R. Pulgar, a poet. And it's with my voiceover narration. This one's like four minutes. And it, what am I going to say about it? I really love it. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm going to say. I love it because I love Eduardo who's in it. And I love it because he's standing in front of a set that I built in my studio to, to make movies. And I like, I guess also that Filmmaking allows me to set up encounters. And so here, this is a record of an encounter I had with Eduardo that wouldn't happen without us making art together. So it's like an art date. And I like that I've made enough films that people understand if I say, can I make a movie of you? What I mean by that, which is let's play. Also, I mean, not just let's play, but let me, in the manner of war, let me spend time with my camera. Um, there's, a, there's a term blazon, B-L-A-Z-O-N, that comes from like troubadour poetry or Renaissance poetry, that you make a blazon of somebody by enumerating their attributes. It's a kind of love poem. And I think of my films as blazons or blasons of their subjects. So here is Eduardo. In seventh grade, I wanted to take typing, but boys were not allowed to take typing. Boys were required to take woodshop. So I made an appointment with the dean. The dean looked like a lean, unimaginative version of Richard Nixon. The dean doubtless knew that I was a lost cause. I told the dean that typing would be my salvation. Or maybe I didn't use religious language. Maybe I just expressed the importance of discipline. Any discipline would do. Math was a discipline. So was woodshop and so was typing. Of the three gateways to pleasure, I chose typing. The dean granted my wish. And as I look back now on my eventful year of typing, I believe that the most valuable lesson was hairdos. The typing teacher had a magnificent controlled bouffant, perhaps too tightly strung. Nonetheless, its finesse and circularity seemed to rhyme with the personality characteristics of a fine typist. I practiced typing every night at home, and I became a fast typist. My speed, like the teacher's bouffant, interested me as a species of modernity. 
Typing fast was a way of being ultra-modern. Later, I would attempt modernity in subtler, quieter ways. I still have the soul of a typist. Typing inculcates intimacy with letters. You grow to love each letter, the B and the G and the L and the M, the A and the T and the V and the Q. The Q has the most fans. Everyone loves a Q. A cue fills in the gaps of the somber afternoon when the sun is setting early and the vowels and consonants are rushing to get home before the curfew envelops us all. Thank you. Um, what I was going to say, this is it, this is why I, I like having made that film, because it's composed of these assignments I gave myself. First, set up the encounter. Eduardo wanted to be in a film, and this is, you know, a lot of negotiation and talking back and forth for years, and yes, we'll do it. There's a date. So then choose the medium. Is it going to be digital video? Is it going to be 16, Super 8? How long will it be? Will there be a script? You know, and it turned out he arrived and he had a typewriter. I had no idea he was going to bring a typewriter. So it was clear that the typewriter would be the center of the film. So, you know, we did various improvisatory stuff and filmed it. Then I thought, then I came home with it, I watched the footage and I thought, yeah, I remember typing, typing in seventh grade. So I wrote that poem and then recited it had to be and then edited the film to be the exact length of the poem. And I thought, my voice by itself is a little dull. Let me improvise some music to go along with it. So had an improvisation session, chose the music to go for the right amount of time. And then I thought, well, it's, it's missing the sound of typing. And so let there be the diegetic sound of typing for that. So I guess that's a lot different than say, I'm going to sit down and write a poem, just like just sit down and do this. This is like a, there's a structure in the world that can happen via filmmaking. I'm going to read a poem now. Um, maybe with a, I don't, do we need a little more light now? We can have a light. Okay, folks, wake up, just get with it, right? Some of you? Okay, good. Okay, so then we're going to read a poem. This is a from several articles, and it's 36 sonnets, but they're not real sonnets. They're disobedient sonnets that take longer than 14 months, but they still earn the right to be called sonnets. Because each, there's like a line, and then the line is tributaries, but there are 14 initiations of mine. 
I'm the, the man that I work in as a writer is dense with references and illusions, none of which you need to understand. It's marks, it's inscriptions. Think of it as scriptita. And they, the ones that you get, you get the ones that you don't. Think of as a sonic bath. Okay, this poem's called Read Martin Herbert. Or Red. Red Martin Herbert's Tell Them I Said No. Essays on artists, including Christopher D'Angelo, who refused the art world. Read Helen Epstein's Children of the Holocaust. Straight guy in row D at a lane name play itched his ass through black jeans while wife rolled her eyes in disdain. Guest list for a party Gregory Batcock threw on March 3rd, 1976, included Jill Johnston, Lucy Mappar, Robert Rosenblum, Andy Warhol, Leo Steinberg, Charlotte Mormon, Linda Knopfler. Failed to describe the devotional fizz of this list's locked time capsule compensation. Father accused of Veronica Lake lookalike of flirting with Randy sailors at a bacala dispensary. I'm shy on candy, says the garçon researching Gypsy Rose Lee. Mora Boy is a mode last beyond my mentally appropriate. My empathic capacities are stunted, unmagnanimous, unattractively mercurial, he reflected after the begrudged funeral. What's the difference between the filmed, the drawn, and the written line? Arachnid arrested by a nude model journeying off with no visible or tactile intervention on my part. Orange, then blue streetlight reflection on rainy pavement proposes each soul makes identical music despite thwart integument imposing belligerent isolation. Bulge-eyed, ballad-chain-worthy writers Risk waste ratio brings out the slave grandee in me. If a rat befriend a new grape, brilliantine, grenadine, incarnadine, acetylene. So thank you.